Welcome to Heaping Spoonful, a twice monthly conversation with restaurateurs, chefs, growers, and others who have helped generate the legends associated with eateries across the Mid-South. The team at Benny Keith is proud to sponsor this adventure with the goal of preserving the stories that have helped cultivate an amazing food scene across the Mid-South. So kick back and enjoy a Heaping Spoonful. Greetings all of you out there in podcast land. I'm Kelly Bass and I welcome you to another episode of Heaping Spoonful. Sponsored by Benny Keith Foods Mid-South Division, this podcast illuminates great stories from chefs and restaurateurs from across the region. As a longtime foodie and I will admit I'm a recovering journalist, I spent 18 years in the newspaper business extending my uh, restaurant reviewing career beyond that. And now I'm a podcast kind of guy, so hootie hoot all that. Today on Heaping Spoonful, I welcome Cole Ellis to the show. He's the founder and chef at Delta Meat Market in the very interesting city of Cleveland, Mississippi, from where he checks in uh, by telephone today. So welcome to Heaping Spoonful, Cole. Thanks, Kelly. Uh, It's great to be here today. Um, You know, first approach to do this by one of our uh, reps at Benny Keith, and and, uh, it seemed like a really great uh, opportunity to kind of tell our story and to also kind of talk about some of the things that are going on in the world today and yeah. how that's affected our business and, and where, yeah. where we're going for the future. Good. I appreciate that. Well, reading about your restaurant and your bar and your approach to uh, each of those makes my mouth water, literally. So also makes me want to come to, to Cleveland, mm-hmm. as I will one of these days, uh, hopefully soon. In reading about your background, it's clear that uh, that you take farm to table, uh, maybe it's ranch to table, a little farther with more personal involvement than many of the folks who run restaurants who put that farm to table um, label on their spots. And meat market may be two of the three words in your restaurant's name, but it's not just for show. So I was real interested to see that you are a raiser of cattle or have been a raiser of cattle or a butcher of cattle uh, and maybe other um, animals as well. So tell us about your butchery program and kind of your background and, and how that all came to be and, and kind of the skill and art of, of that part of your business. Well, um, I mean, it all began, I was fortunate enough to go to a culinary school in Charleston, South Carolina, the Culinary Institute of Charleston. Uh, And there I got to work in my first cold kitchen. We got to see some of our first, like, uh, productions of of terrines and um, breaking down on primals to subprimals and to just, you know, like, kind of spark that curiosity in my brain. Uh, after graduating the Culinary Institute, my wife and I decided that we wanted to move a little closer to home, her being from Jackson, Tennessee, and me being from where we are now in in Cleveland, Mississippi. Uh, We chose Nashville, and uh, Nashville was really one of those places that I had an opportunity to take it to the next level with my relationship, not only with with butchering, but also with food in general, and and like, um, I guess for the, the... the evolution of that relationship, knowing where it came from and, and knowing how to treat and, and use every portion, whether it's every part of a carrot, whether it's every part of a cow. Right. Um, but to take those things and, and, and hone our skill, at, you know, full utilization of the products. Sure. And uh, there in Nashville, I was lucky enough to work at the Hermitage Hotel for almost seven and a half years under Tyler Brown. And, uh, I worked my way through the ranks from a uh, banquet chef, uh, to a sous to chef de cuisine of the restaurant and, uh, eventually just controlling all the outlets and a lot of opportunities began to present themselves after two or three years of being there. We, um, had a partnership with the land trust of Tennessee and there was a property not far from, the hotel itself on 8th Avenue, I mean, excuse me, on 6th Avenue, the property itself was on 8th Avenue, closer to Brentwood. Mm-hmm. And uh, the state was called Glen Levin. And it was it was a uh, an antebellum home that had at one point served as a hospital. And um, it sat on a track of land about 66 acres. And it just sat there kind of idle. And Tyler started to scheme these visions of, 
of what to do with it. And there was a farm to table program that involved children first. And then um, we developed that into um, a small cattle operation. And then after that, the hotel saw what we were doing and the traction of it and allowed us to buy, buy another track of land in Kingston Springs, which we started then a 250 acre cattle farm. Um, and it was just, I mean, it's just really amazing to see firsthand, like how, you know, things that normally come to us on the back of a truck and in a box, how they, you know, truly start being pastured and what, you know, type of things change the quality and, and a chef's mindset of what the product is and how it, you know, it makes sure. it to the plate. Yeah, that's, that's true. I mean, again, what so now, go ahead. So, oh, sorry. So, so, you know, now we've just carried, I've just taken a lot of that knowledge and, and, and know how, and, and obviously a lot of mistakes co-mingled in there and tried to turn them into a business that to me stands out in a location that we are, you know, essentially the communities and towns that surround the Delta, I mean, that, that surround Cleveland and the Delta are, and they're food deserts. Um, some people, their pantry is a dollar general. Um, sure. Some people, it might be just the corner store. So it allows us to offer something different and unique and broad range, you know, anything from South to a nice, you know, beef tenderloin, uh, just, it's been, it's been great for us to try to try to learn the relationship sure. and how, you know, we can deliver food in a different level. Sure. And I, again, knowing that what happens with a, with a, let's take a cow for instance, from the get go and from what they eat and how they're raised and what that ends up affecting the, the end product. Very few um, chefs and restaurateurs get that chance. Yes, they can buy the best cuts that they know to buy, but they didn't start with the beginning. So, so this, again, I was looking at your, your background and, and being from Mississippi, I know you went to college at Mississippi State and after a couple of years said, you know what, I'm not sure I want to do this or at least not pursue the major you're pursuing and that you moved to Charleston. Now, I know you went to work in restaurants there. Was that the plan or were you just a guy who said, I'm in Charleston, I need to make some money and a restaurant job sounds good? Well, that, that, was, that was the initial plan. Uh, I've done it all throughout. Uh, I kind of started in high school around 15 years old kind of hard to think that i've been doing this for almost 20 something years 23 right. years right uh but you know first job was here at a restaurant a local restaurant uh and it sparked it for me and the year at mississippi state and the years in high school kind of led me up to the point where i am now and led me to think that you know like there's more to just uh like cooking there to, to me like and especially for the first probably 10 years plus of doing it it certainly wasn't the paycheck. It was, um, you know, it, it was that smile you get from the customer enjoying something that you laid hands on, that you sure. had an opportunity to manipulate into something delicious. Um, and you know, it just, it, it blossomed from there. It, it was, you know, the relationship of sitting around stirring cornbread with my grandmother and how those feelings and nuances can be presented in a commercial environment and can be presented where, you know, yeah. you make money doing it and you can have fun. So instead of being an accountant, I said, I'm going to take the leap of faith and try this out. Sure. So you worked in restaurants for a while before you started culinary school and you're in Charleston. I mean, no one could ever argue that Charleston is not one of the great food cities, not just of the South, but of the United States or of the world. I mean, there's great culinary schools here, there and everywhere, but being in Charleston and then after you got through culinary school, you stayed and worked at some restaurants that are very famous, both in Charleston, and then you went out to Kew Island, which is there off the coast. Um, so I guess you just got brought up in the low country cuisine of, of that area and, and do the things you learned, uh, not just at school, but really working in restaurants in, in South Carolina. I'm sure you carried those to Nashville, and they, do they still impact how you cook today? Absolutely, but I use a lot less of the the terminology like low country. Right. But the philosophy of low country and the philosophy of southern food, like you know, in general, like southern food is the only original cuisine of America. You know, like it's, it's. I mean, these are ingredients and ideas that were brought over, and and America is always described as a melting pot of cultures and variety, 
and and southern food is just that you know whether it be the seeds brought over whether it be the influence of thomas jefferson during uh his first stint of you know head of agriculture uh it's just all, like all those things and ingredients started to come together and, and i feel like that's what the low country cuisine is itself too you know it's sure it's a broad, you know, a variety of the, you know, you know, original American cooking. <laughs> yeah, um, all the ingredients are indigenous to the area. We're all grown by the the folks who live there, and uh, you know, again, I laugh sometimes at the whole farm to table <clears throat> concept, since that's the only way anybody ever knew how to cook before we feel realize you could throw a bag of frozen vegetables on, on a truck in California and drive it across the country, which. Uh, you know, still happens, but at least um, folks like you and others in the field have have taken that back. So Cleveland, Mississippi is home. It's not a city that a lot of people know a whole lot about, but it sounds like an interesting place. And I was uh, intrigued to see that there's a Grammy museum there. So there's two Grammy museums, one in Los Angeles and one naturally in Cleveland, Mississippi. Uh, and then, of course, Cleveland, Ohio has the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. So you, these Clevelands are doing good work. And then they have cool restaurants like yours <laughs> and, and cool hotels like the Cotton House where you're now located. Tell, so there you are in Nashville. You're closer to your wife's home in Jackson and you're closer to your home in, in Mississippi. And then in 2013, it was time to come back to Cleveland. What, what led you to do that? Um, well, we had just had our daughter, uh, Charlotte, or mm -hmm. we call her Lottie. Uh, mm -hmm. Lottie was born in 2013. And it seems like immediately when she was born, we sold our house. <laughs> my wife could kill me for this. Yeah. Sold our house, moved into an apartment, <laughs> finished out my tenure at the hotel, moved her down to my parents' house while we were finishing renovations on another house and building a business all at the same time. Yes, yes, yes. Um, the reason... The reason why we chose Cleveland is kind of long-winded, but um, we had the opportunity to to take over her family's farm. Uh, it's a century farm in Tennessee. It's in Dyer County. Mm -hmm. um, it was, uh, you know, not necessarily saying dilapidated old farmhouse, but it needed a lot of work. I wanted to add this. We both had this idea, uh, a whimsical idea of trying to turn this property into a bed and breakfast uh, and get the farm fired back up. And there were some, there was some red tape there. Uh, there were people that still held leases on the land, uh, for a longer period of time than we wanted them to. And it just didn't, things weren't quite lining up there. Right. Um, so we left kind of kicking the ground and, and disappointed. This was about a year before we moved and we came down to Cleveland and, you know, just, just spending a day or two before we went back home and kind of started to look around and, and we enjoyed the company of people, the locals here, you know, kids all their lives fight, especially being from a small town, fight living in that small town. They say they're going to break out. They're, I'm going to go do what I want to do. I'm going to go. I can't wait till I turn 18. I'm out of this place, you know, and sure. And, and sure. I had that, I had that chip on my shoulder and that was the mindset I was in and, and, Coming back almost, you know, like 10, 12 years later, we said to ourselves, well, maybe this isn't so, maybe this isn't so bad. Maybe this could be fun. Maybe, you know, like, we love the people. We love the, I mean, it's quaint. It's sure. a town that's really invested in their main street. And mm -hmm. uh, just, you know, it's just, it's, just a, it's just a great, warm and welcome place to be. And we kind of enjoy it. We kind of fell in love with it again and, and sure. started to make plans. Um, Looks better at 30 than it did at 18, I'm sure particularly with the, you know, then and, and you, and you gone out and lived in the real big world. You'd been, you know, you've been in Charleston and it sounds like a really busy life in Nashville between all that you were doing at the hotel and the restaurant and the farm and all of that. And then all of a sudden Lottie comes along and wow, you could use a little, uh, although you didn't sound like you jumped into a life of leisure when you got back to Mississippi. Well, listen, Cole, we're going to take a short break here on Heaping Spoonful. Thanks to everybody for listening to us today. We're going to be back in just a bit with Cole Ellis of Dell to Meat Market. I hope you're enjoying this episode of Heaping Spoonful. We at Benny Keith Foods enjoy talking about the food scene almost as much as we enjoy providing the top quality ingredients 
that help restaurateurs and chefs across the Mid-South create their magic. Now let's dive even deeper into the culinary world with your host, Kelly Bass. All right, everybody, welcome back to Heaping Spoonful. Our goal today, uh, excuse me, our guest today is Cole Ellis of Delta Meat Market in Cleveland, Mississippi. Um, both Cole and his establishment are making a major mark on the culinary scene of the South. Um, so again, you're you're back in Cleveland, Mississippi, and uh, realizing you like it better than it looked like when you left there uh, a little bit into college. Um, but and you opened Delta Meat Market, and of course now, you know, I looked at the menu and I've read about the accolades. But when you opened Delta Meat Market, it was a meat market, and I guess at that time too, a specialty market as well. Tell us the original vision, not what it later became, but the original vision for Delta Meat Market when you opened it. Absolutely. So in November 2013, uh, we opened, and I had this idea that I was going to take a small break from the the restaurant itself, um, and I was going to focus on those products and those ingredients and try to share the ingredients themselves with the average cook and the average person and uh, the folks of our, you know, our great community and, and give them an opportunity to share the passion with us and, 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 you know, dream about getting families back around the table and, you know, uh, breaking bread from a different sense as opposed to sitting in the drive through line as yeah. right there in front of people. And, and, and when we opened the doors in 2013, we opened it up with two meat cases, no dining room tables, a few tables that we made out of pallets uh, for display and merchandise. And, you know, it was just basically that and our chalkboard. And we just wanted to try to, you know, give it the old college try. We had, we'd done it with some of the money we made from off of selling our house and, and it blossomed into the, a, a lot of different things. Um, we never really thought that it would be the, a restaurant per se. We, we more so wanted it to be a hub for other restaurants, you know, like future endeavors in the Delta. Once we got down here, right. became rooted and started to see the things that we need here. Um, and it just be, basically be a, a way for me to control quality to get it to those outlets sure. in the future. So what was on the, and, what was uh, on, what was on the chalkboard? Was that, no, those weren't pre- prepared items. Those were just things you had in your meat case and, and things like that. Y- y- yeah, well, some were prepared items. But they'd be like things that were in our, our meat case, our freezer, you know, pricing for pimento cheese. You know, just different things like right. that. Um, uh, Delta tamales, you know, just just sure. a broad range of, of items and, and special and 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 might be even tip of the day. Um, and we would just kind of we lure people in. I mean, we're on the downtown strip, so. We would get foot traffic, you know. People would come out, oh, what's this place? You know, I heard about mm-hmm. this place. Oh, they sell steaks. Oh, they sell this, that, and the other. Well, you know, eventually you start to run into things like, what am I going to do with the trimmings for my tenderloin? Ah. I'm heaping with ground beef right now. Sure. What do I do with that? So, you know, and in our natural sense, we just said, well, we got to make things with it. We got to turn them into something else. So, right. uh, charcuterie started, program started to develop. Uh, Take and bake meatloafs started going on. Um, different types of hamburger. We'd grind uh, our homemade bacon into our burger meat, and you'd have a burger that, no matter how bad of a cook dad was, <laughs> the burger still came out juicy and <laughs> right. smoky and delicious. You know, like good old bacon. Uh, yeah. So, so these, these kind of absolutely. So these things kind of you know just kept kept going for us, and and it's almost like the town challenged us to. To do a little restaurant in there. Yeah. Um, and the good news was you knew you as knew, things kept expanding. We had a, right. You knew how to do that. Yeah. You'd done that. Yeah. We, we knew. A little <laughs> <bit>. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We we, we kind of knew what to do there. So um, we answered the calling. Um, we started out with a um, we had a walk in refrigerator that was literally in the middle of the dining room, but it had doors like a like a gas station would. You know. Yeah. So you got all of our like. To me, I feel like we were one of the first people, us in a, bur- a local burger joint, one of the first people to introduce craft beers to, mm-hmm. the, to the scene, you know, and, and get excited about that. And, and again, just so it was always something we were, we were the weird place. We wanted to introduce something different. And um, 
we just kept pushing on that and pushing on that and, and beer really took off for us. All of a sudden we'd look up on a Thursday and people would be bringing chairs and <laughs> posting up to wait for the delivery or to try new things. And, and then Thursday turned into Friday. I said, Hey, I got an idea. Some of these things that we're having a hard time selling, let's take that and let's try to, let's give away a few samples of it on Friday. You know, let, let's put a theme behind it. Let's, let's make an idea of it. And, and it's kind of a joke because everybody does a happy hour all week long, you know, like leading up to the weekend. Our joke was on Friday, we're going to do a happy hour on Friday. Yeah. Um, typically it's a, it's a day that people wouldn't need to do that. Well, we sold beer to people to enjoy, um, that eventually turned into wine and other libations. But, uh, when we start giving away a few products, well, I called up five friends and I said, Hey, bring, you know, bring, bring somebody with you. We'll, we'll see how this goes. So the first weekend it was five, like, Oh, that's fun. You know, like second weekend, 10, and this grew exponentially throughout the weeks and, and 15, 20, 50, it just became something that people were looking forward to. Sure. Well, that turned into us starting to sell for dinner. Um, we would put two to three items on the chalkboard. We had an opportunity to just really focus on them and produce them and make them really tasty, great items. They were constantly rotating. I think that, you know, drove a little excitement. And before we noticed it, we were starting to become, you know, that restaurant, but we're almost becoming something else. I was seeing the same faces every day, every time. And, and then like if, if there was a friend from out of town, they would bring their friend from out of town. Right. And I started to notice something completely different. It wasn't a restaurant either. It was like a, it was a, just a hangout. It was a community yeah. anchor point of, of, of folks that just wanted to come hang out. And it just, I don't know, again, and get that after 20 years of getting beat down in, in the restaurant business, all of a sudden it's, people are enjoying this again. And you know, we're yeah. bringing those smiles and, and it's, and it's, it's fun again, you know, and, and you became the cool, um, the cool place. I forgot about the, the, you became the cool place to be, you know, of sorts. Um, and, uh, you know, again, we started expanding a little bit more and, and offering a little bit more. And we had lunch six days a week and we did dinner a few more days a week. And it's just, it just grew from there. Did you have the kit? Is, is your kitchen adequate to handle all that? Or have you had to make it grow or you just had to wedge in there and do it? Man, it, it was, uh, it was pretty interesting. So one thing that we always, I told everybody, I was like, listen, if we're ever going to be a restaurant, um, I just want to be a little bit different than everything else. I was like, the first thing you want to be a different restaurant in the Mississippi Delta. First things first, don't buy a fryer. So we That'll never fried anything. Yeah. And if we did, if we were fried, yeah, if we were frying chicken or something like that, it was on the stovetop and cast iron skillets. Yeah. Um, so, so, you know, like we just always try to step out and put our, our interpretation on classic or, or different things. And, and, right. Even if we're force feeding some folks, we noticed that people started to trust us, you know, even sure. if they couldn't pronounce that word on the board or they didn't know what it was like, they, they trusted us. And, and that part was warming to us and we kept on pushing and we take time and we do R and D on items that just, you know, were exciting to us. That's really cool. So along the way, so you're there for years and then this, this whole, the restaurant side grew in it and I can tell it just became the cool place to be. Um, I guess you had to go buy some tables so, so folks didn't have to bring their own chairs anymore to enjoy their beer and their, their, their samples on Fridays. But so meanwhile, is it a completely, I mean, <laughs> yeah, oh, you built them even better. So across the street, <laughs> uh, relatively across the street, it, there's, there's a, a new hotel going up called the Cotton House. Um, is that something, I mean, were you involved in that process from the get go or did they come to you and say, Hey, we'd really like to have a restaurant here. Do you want to do it? Or, or I don't even know the connection points between you and, and that place. Well, you know, a lot of the people that were coming in there and drinking and hanging out at the bar or quote, you know, loose term bar, uh, were local friends of mine and, and lo and behold became investors in the property and, mm -hmm. Um, I guess about five, four and a half, five years ago or so, maybe four and a half years ago, we've started to talk about it or the idea of it. And 
I was approached by the developer to to come in and do a restaurant, and I signed on at the at the the you know in the beginning. Um, sure. I swore to myself after I left the Hermitage Hotel, I was never going to work in a hotel again. Uh, <laughs> just because twenty four seven, yeah. You know the yeah the rigmarole of, of what hotels are and uh, momentary lapse of reasoning, I uh, decided to to do it. Did you move lock, stock, and barrel over there, or did you keep the meat market across the street? No, we, we moved everything ever. We have a full-service okay. uh, butcher shop and everything located here at right the there. bottom of the hotel. Cool. We had never – we we actually didn't intend – we didn't intend on doing it. We actually had intended on leaving the meat market where it was, and, again, we were going to fulfill my idea of having, to, having a restaurant to supply from the meat market, mm-hmm. and – Things started to shift. Things started to change. And I, I, on my 15th attempt to buy the building that we were in, I'd offered the guy, geez, I'd offered him double what it had appraised for. And he still wouldn't sell it to me. So okay, I folded and decided to move yeah. the meat market over. And we did a yeah. small redesign. Now, did you have um, many of your long timers over across the street that, that kind of started coming to you when it was the Friday samples and the say, oh, man, you're never going to recreate the atmosphere. This place is so cool. Now you're going to go across the street, and it's going to be all fancy and gentrified, and it won't have the same vibe. Was there any worry about that, or did you just figure if you're there and your food's there and your customer's there, it's going to be fine? It's always been my biggest concern because uh, you mean the fence posts, I, I do enjoy feeding everyone, but the locals are important, most important to me. Sure. Uh, I could care less about the guests on many, on many levels, but... Uh, you know, I, that's the relationship we started with, and that's where we wanted to make sure that we, we held strong with it. Yeah, there were yeah. skeptics about it. Uh, some people were very upset with me. And I just tried to level with them, and I tried to pr- produce and, and provide the exact same product that we had sure. before. And, you know, you tried to buy the building, and the guy wouldn't sell it for a, re- a for a nice price, so you really didn't have a lot of choice in the matter. So now, though, uh, you know, just like you were at the Hermitage, you're back in the – Seven days a week, you know, breakfast, lunch, dinner kind of deal. It looks like the only meal you don't do maybe is Sunday dinner, I think I saw on the menu, but or on the website. But so I guess there's no choice. I mean, you got to you got to have breakfast for hotel guests and God, breakfast looks great. But did, did that let you kind of spread your wings a little bit and go, here's here's my take on breakfast? Because I hadn't really done that across the street, but now I'm going to do a really cool breakfast. And, and of course, you were already doing lunch, but did it really kind of let you expand out a little bit? It did. I mean, truth be told, I feel like I make the best biscuit in the universe. Uh, Man. And, you know, I love eating biscuits. I do, too. I'm still coming, uh, so, so I'm still coming to Cleveland. That, that and grits and everything else. But, man, I, I would love to meet the person that knows how to make money on breakfast. It's just so hard as an independent. Yeah. Uh, sure. But, uh, we, you know, breakfast breakfast is fun. Uh I feel like people don't eat breakfast as much as they do dinner, obviously. But, uh, you know, it, it's, it's great to try that out and, and to switch over, to shift over from counter service to full service uh, was also really fun and, and interesting to try to, you know, to teach a different level of, of service that we hope to be, you know, remarked for or known for. Right. And I'm I'm guessing you got the chance to make the kitchen the way you wanted the kitchen because you were in from the ground up, right? Right. Uh, we did. We did, certainly. Um, some of those things uh, were great, you know. Um, yeah. You always think about this dream kitchen, how you want to do it. We almost made it there. <laughs> yeah, well, that's, that's um, good. It never turned yeah. out exactly like you want. Right, but with the budget we had, we had, uh, we had two kitchens to build, actually. So uh, that, part was, that part was interesting, too. So two uh, meaning the one the one that's the kitchen also for the bar? downstairs and then the one for upstairs oh. and bar fontaine right right so bar fontaine looks fun so it's a unlike the your restaurant which is still delta meat market which is you know again 7 days a week breakfast and everything bar fontaine at least at the websites right is more of a afternoon evening limited days um, operation is that correct yeah, so so it, you know, it's the edgy city-bound 
oasis here in the Delta, I feel like. Uh, it's a it's a bar that offers craft cocktails and um, a touch of, like, European bistro style foods mm-hmm. and um, and a hell of a whiskey selection. Um, Sweet. The menu kind of skews Italian, which is interesting. Is that just something you like to do and said, here's my chance, because I hadn't been doing that in the meat market? Uh, yeah, so, so partially we started out solely as an Italian restaurant um, with, you know, a little bit of Spanish undertone. And, and we wanted, again, we've always just tried to provide something a little different and uh, homemade pastas and and mm-hmm. other things just kind of fit the bill for that. And a community that was rooted on Italian farmers and Chinese grocers and just, again, that, that melting pot that's found right here in a different concentration of the Delta was something we wanted to embrace, and and uh, that was an avenue for us. That's really, really cool. Um, I see that you've been a James Beard finalist, and your restaurant's been featured in many top magazines that report on the South and the, the wonderfulness that's the South. And most recently, I see that last year you were named the number three best Southern chef in Southern Living Magazine. Pretty good for a butcher. I really, that's, that's impressive. Um, besides being flattered person, <laughs> besides being flattered personally, has this, has that attention in the, in the, the honors, has that, have you seen a positive impact on your business from people who know about that and say, Hey, we got to go check that place out. Absolutely. Um, you know, we could not have been more lucky on many aspects. <laughs> yeah, um, that's, that's. But I could. But we can't. We can't do those sort of things without a great team. And, and I've got a. I got a group of folks that take it seriously and are go getters and and just. I'm happy to be in their presence. Yeah. Well, that's. I'm. I'm happy for you and proud for you. That that just sounds like such a cool place. Um, I I see that you. I'm guessing. I know the answer here, but. I see that you were advertised as going to do a James Beard dinner called Southern Meats Italian, which sounds totally logical based on what you're doing at your restaurant and what you're doing at Bar Fontaine. Did that happen, or was that shot down by the virus? It, it did happen. It, uh, Good. It happened on February 22nd. And oh, okay. Oh, you got in under the wire for sure. And yeah, I'm pretty sure that uh, we came back... Uh, we had about a five day period where we were, you know, versus being in a larger metropolitan area, mm-hmm. maybe a, maybe a week and a half. I, I remember doing a really big wedding, like the first week of March and then the world screeched to a halt. Boy, did it ever. I mean, the symphony went down with the Titanic and <laughs> that was, that was all she wrote. Yeah, well, we're uh, we hope. Yeah, we hope that people are listening to this episode of uh, Heaping Spoonful on forever and ever and ever and all around the universe. But we'll re- report that we're recording this in in mid to late June of 2020. So a few months after you got to do that James Beard dinner, and and pretty much everything around our part of the United States kind of shut down March 10th to 15th, kind of. So did when all the in in very state. Yeah, it's, it varies state by state, but did you guys, either yourself or the authorities, say, okay, you're going to have to close it down? And, and, and you know, at least in Arkansas, everybody was shut, and then there's been a little bit of return to, to take out, and now you can actually have restaurants open. Where did you all stand in that whole continuum of dealing with this thing? Well, amidst uh, finding ourselves victim or in the lull of COVID-19, we... We weren't forced to close by the authorities, but we acknowledged there was a problem. Um, I started to read more about symptoms and things like that. And after getting back from New York, I was kind of scared that we had been exposed. Uh, One of the gentlemen that was with me, who was actually in Nashville, uh, seemed to have contracted the, the quote unquote, the symptoms. And we didn't close for that reason. We were a little naive, even if it was you know, a real thing or, um, I mean, sure. You never, you just never think about those things hitting the homeland. Oh, I know. Um, and, and, and that week after that giant wedding, we did the first weekend of of March Monday came around and things started to slow down. And I started to say to myself, okay, 
uh, something's not right. Um, we were doing less than half of our, you know, our capacity and our, our volume. And I, I started to wake up a little bit about it. And then the next Sunday came around and we had one of the worst brunches we've ever had in our lives. Br- brunches in a butcher shop. Brunches is one of those things that is the best yep. possible scenario for a butcher shop. It, it's an opportunity to wipe the slate, literally, <laughs> chalk yeah. up a new menu you know, and, and push out some of those things and, and, you know, get that food cost down. Sure. Um, I sat there, I was beside myself. I did one of the things I always do during a period of reflection. I drive over to the river. Uh, sometimes I find myself with a six pack of beer staring at it. You know, <laughs> I've done that. I went to, col- uh, I went to college in Memphis. I did that a lot. Yeah. So I knocked, I knocked the dust off myself. I, w- I said to myself, I wasn't going to be, you know, this whole week I've been, after the wedding, the whole week leading up to the the next weekend, I'd been thinking about like, man, this thing's getting bad. Oh, it's spreading. What? 5,000 people, 10,000 people, you know? So now we're probably around March. Well, 15th, 15th was so. the 15th was Sunday. Yep. Cause St. Patrick's day yeah. was on Tuesday. We, I, I closed. Yeah. Okay. So I, I closed, I closed that Monday before St. Patrick's day. And I said to myself, okay, we got to do something. And at that point, I drafted a menu for casseroles to do takeout only. Really, I didn't even do takeout. We just we just rested on casseroles. We got with uh, the girls at, at our marketing group, and we sat down. We, you know, we just had a little sit down and said, this is where we need to do. This is where we need, you know, the people at the hotel were a little bit off put by. They were like, I don't understand why. I was like, well... Maybe you should pick up a newspaper. Yeah, um, you're going to know. Turn on CNN. We did, a, we did a response. Yeah, we did a responsible thing, and we shut the doors and just did casseroles. We pushed hard on delivery. We why we sold wine by the bottle. We yeah. um, started making cocktails until they told us to stop making cocktails because uh, it was illegal. And we packaged all these things up, and we pushed real hard on learning new cuisines. We were doing Indian food and Chinese food and all these things. So we almost didn't even skip a beat before we changed this. We metamorphosized back into what we were. Uh, We had started as a grocery store and we found ourselves in the right place and knew exactly what to do when it was time to be a grocery store again. Sure. Um, the meat market didn't stop spinning. The world may have, but we didn't, you know, uh, we did, we did really great business. Uh, the first people were welcoming and warming and they understood the situation and we did really, really good business for what, you know, the time. Right. And we pushed through that. We pushed through for that about the next like eight, nine weeks. And, uh, it seemed like we hit like the 10th or 12th week somewhere in there. And, uh, Somebody opened up Florida, you know, like yeah, yeah. whoever that person was, I would like yeah. to kick him in the pants. <laughs> um, but they opened up Florida and then it seemed like everybody just disappeared, you know, like we're not a vacation town. We're not a destination place. We're not on the beach. Yeah. So locals and alike, you know, everybody just disappeared. And we saw our significant drop in business by, you know, almost half of what we had done. And with everything opening back up, we realized that, we needed to probably start planning to do the same thing. Mm-hmm. So again, we drove over to the river, we stared, stared at the water, we took that six pack and dusted ourselves off and started getting ready for service again, but we would only let people stay outside. Right. The fortunate part about that for us was uh, the most wonderful weather Mississippi seen to date in April, May, and even the first week of June, <laughs> man, we were lucky. Uh, oh, well, we were too. We got some really good, really, really good weather and still knock on wood, no mosquitoes, but they're coming. Yep. And <laughs> we went, we broke into the old meat market over there. We stole the chalkboard off the board, off the wall. We put it back up on the new walls and we started, we started back the way we, we began and just yeah. kept on going. So are you back rolling? Are you? Are people, Here we are. In the, 
Yeah. We're week, week yeah, yeah. So, 14. So here we are in a week, 157. <laughs> it seems, well, it seems yeah. like an eternity. It does. So are you, uh, are you back open inside now, or are you still just doing people outside? We are back open. Um, we've been forced. So we've been forced to kind of limit our hours and accessibility. We still haven't opened the bar upstairs. Mm-hmm. Um, a number of people have asked me, hey, when are you going to open the bar upstairs? I said, I, my typical response is whenever we fill this place up with enough people, you know, like right. to afford to open upstairs. Sure. I did this all on my dime. I haven't had any investors or backers, you know, mm-hmm. this was all done with, you know, the money that we saved up and we've grown over the years. Like if I needed a, a refrigerator, we saved up and bought it, you know, like we didn't, we just didn't have deep pockets. So, so sure. where we are is, is, the same mindset, you know, like we're going to grow it at the pace that we can afford to grow it at. Right. And, um, the meal periods have been hit or miss. Uh, it's costing us approximately a thousand dollars more a week in PPE. Yep. Um, we've had some generous tippers. We've been real fortunate for that. Uh, and we're scared to bring people back. I mean, I look at my employees, like, social accounts, you know, like Instagrams and their Facebook pages and stuff. And I see them out partying and doing this, that, and the other. And like, I'm terrified to bring that lack of responsibility back to my business. So I take the ones that I feel that I'm comfortable with and that's where we are, you know, like yeah, it's I a- coach up the ones that aren't, that aren't doing so well and tell them, listen, if I can see some positivity, I'm going to try to bring you back when we can. And, and we're just trying to be as you know as responsible as possible. That's all you can do. I know. Well, listen. Good luck on all of that. It's uh, it's un- I mean the, the word unprecedented has been used too many times, but it, let's let's hope we can look back in fifteen or twenty years and say, well, we never went through anything like that again, but for sure. But when everything gets a little more normal, I've already my first thing I'm doing when we we get off the phone with each other is I'm gonna. Map quest how far it is from Little Rock, Arkansas to Cleveland, Mississippi, and start planning my trip because I'm ready to come down there and check it out. And I thank you, Cole. I really do for being our oh, guest. Great. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm going to call my wife and tell her she she knew who I was talking to. I'm going to tell her what we're missing out on, and we won't be missing out on it forever. Well, listen, thanks for being our guest today on Heaping Spoonful. Uh, also, I appreciate all of you out there listening to the the broadcast today. Remember, we post new episodes every two weeks, so. Come back soon and enjoy more episodes of Heaping Spoonful. Thanks, everybody. We hope you enjoyed this episode of Heaping Spoonful. On behalf of all of us at Benny Keith Foods, Mid-South Division, please know how much we love connecting you with the legends of the culinary scene and their unique stories. I look forward to the next time we can offer you another Heaping Spoonful. Thank you.